Howdy there, folks. This is, uh, it's, it's kind of part two or the, the counterpart to a, a video I put out not that long ago that focused mostly on blockading ports, talk really probably more in depth than anybody cares to about uh, the efficiency of blockading. And I mentioned it, it was something that was more, I think it was probably more for the, the union player, maybe playing in 61, 62, possibly 63. And I wasn't really sure if it was worth it for the CSA. I haven't come to a verdict on whether uh, blockading is, is cost efficient for the CSA, but I have taken up the other side of that fight, uh, actually quite quite literally playing the other side of that campaign uh, <coughs> as CSA and talking about how to fight against the, the the blockade. And the really short answer is take take those cotton clad ramps. I mean, I've talked about them before uh, in campaign, and and I might have mentioned them in other tutorials, but uh, when you actually test them and, and count what they are worth against what they are destroying, uh, th they are making back their value many times over. So this is not going to be as, as numbers heavy as some of the other videos I've done. But the basic idea that I'll start out with is... Mm, no, it's this one. <coughs> take a look at the price of various fleets and it, it looks at the construction cost plus how much it costs to just get that ship all the provisions it needs and gets it out and and, and, and uh, fighting it doesn't really count any of the reprovision stuff so the cotton clad ram is the one I tested is kind of the, the CSA's weapon uh, the Union only gets them if they capture them from the CSA and they do uh, occasionally uh, but it's really that the CSA is kind of asymmetrical response to the, the Union resource advantage. And you see each one of these runs about 200 and let me see if I'm getting this right, $240,000 to get out and, and running. And I put them in a fleet of 10 to start out with. And so nice run numbers, that's about a $2.4 million fleet. And then for, for a number of the fleets I took on early, uh, I calculated the the value based on how many ships and and this column here. So that's just the the, the methodology. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. And uh, go back to the campaign. Remember that those cotton clads are really easy to build. Move past it. It it only needs a level one port level. So it can pretty much be built anywhere. Don't worry about the use of cotton. Cotton prices are typically quite low. Uh, I mean, we've talked about the price of it, so I don't really want to dwell on it too much more. Uh, but there it is, and we'll talk about some of its impressive results. Now, this isn't that. All right, so <clears throat> I'll talk about what happened, uh, and then maybe talk a little bit about what's going on here. But the first kind of feast for the uh, Cotton Cloud Armada of, of 10 was down here in New Orleans, and these there were two Union blockading squadrons. I think they're a little bit further back, but they're basically where they are now. And it they went up against I believe it was this Gulf blockading squadron 2 and it had six frigates and a steam frigate. And I thought we were going to lose. <laughs> I, I did not think there's any any anywhere we were going to win that. Uh we went in there and we wiped the entire fleet with those 10 conclads. Uh that fleet disintegrated. Uh, close to half of the remaining cotton clads that we had did have health at 50% or, or slightly less. So it's not like we, we didn't take any damage in doing this, uh, but it was a, a huge trade. That fleet in and of itself, those seven ships, cost about $11 million. So we invested two and a half million, wiped out, I'll say at least 11 million. It disintegrated. So <clears throat> the Conclad squadron, by the way, at the end, we still have a two and a half million dollar squadron that's ready to go and do other things. And they have nothing. We actually got a two for one here. And it's because the AI did something. I think they're repeating the mistake again is that they had this secondary kind of sister blockading squadron here, and it's set to attack. 
as I found out. Because when I attacked this squadron, this one moved to engage it, and you can probably see the problem that they ran themselves into. They ran themselves into the problem known as Fort Morgan. And they got beat, and they disintegrated. So basically, the, the ten cottonclads threw a little bit of uh, accidental... It, it looks like cunning, but we really weren't that clever. Uh, we wiped both of those fleets for very little. Uh, I then retested it and sent the cottonclad fleet out to attack uh, this fleet first. And we again wiped it. And then this fleet made the exact same mistake, but got stuck on Fort Gaines. And then I think we engaged it with the cottonclads. And so we ended up sinking them both, no matter which one we attacked first. So I don't know if anybody's out there is listening, has the capability to make this work. Maybe have those those blockading fleets back a little bit further. Like you can tell this one is, if this is set to attack, and I attack one of these others, we're just going to run them right into the ships. Yeah, I understand that they are more efficient when they're up close like this. Uh, and how they threaded that needle, yeah, I guess I guess they can. Uh, it's, well, it, they, they'd be better off doing a little bit less good on the blockading and not lose their entire fleet to, to kind of being gamed out uh, or just set them to defensive stance. That that actually probably would be the, the best solution that would allow some of these fleets to get up close without uh, accidentally running into to forts. So yeah, trading $11 million of their stuff for $2.5 million of ours, and we get to keep our $2.5 million, uh, we really didn't end up losing anything after, after repairs. And by the way, that sister fleet then had four sidewheel frigates and three steam sloops. So it wasn't $11 million like this one, but it was, I, I did do a rough calculation, and it was still uh, well more than what the cotton clads were worth, and because we got that other fleet to, to sink when it joined, uh, it, it was just a tremendous value trade. Uh, oh, so it was $7.8 million for that other, it wasn't an estimate, it was a calculation of those four sidewheel frigates and three steam sloops. So, uh, that's still trading upwards about three times, whereas the other fleet was about a, a four times trade up. Um, the next big engagement we had was up here in the Chesapeake, which is no no big surprise if you've played the spring or summer 61 campaigns. Uh, the AI has this tendency when it comes to its navies. I don't know if it has any examples here. No, I don't, I don't see any. But it, it sometimes has a tendency to, yeah, yeah, okay, it does, to kind of stack fleets one on top of the other. Uh, and so we, we ran into that here in the Chesapeake. And, and it, it's a challenge. I don't think the AI is trying to be clever about it. But it makes it a challenge to see what you're, you're going into. So you're, you're flying a little blind. But it turned out that one of those fleets was a uh, seven stack of sloops of war, which cost about five point seven million to build and launch. Six fourth rate steamers, which cost only about six hundred thousand. A second rate. The, the entire bag there was about six point nine million. So we went. We went in there. We sent the cottonclads charging in. Uh, I think we had complement of 10 and we beat those two fleets but it was, it was something like a pillow fight because one of the downside of, of conclads is that they just don't bring a lot of guns and it takes a while to ram through and I was not giving any of the fleets then perks I think so, eh, maybe, maybe I still hadn't given them any perks and so I wasn't going to give them torpedoes but they didn't have the, the XP for it anyways at this point so we sent them in and we, we beat those two squadrons, but just as we were about to finish them off, a third squadron of theirs came in. And we also had ran into ammo problems, which dragged down our readiness. Just being in combat dragged down our readiness as well. And, and so here's a kind of lesson I'll get back to at the end, which is that uh, sequencing attacks at sea, especially if the, the, the kind of first or maybe even the second fleet in, they fight separate battles, uh, if, if they're really good at absorbing hits without taking a lot of losses, they can drive down an enemy fleet's readiness so that you just send in a second or a third fleet to, to finish off whatever the problem is, and you'll beat them just on readiness. They won't have the readiness to take the fight, and they'll have to run. And that's exactly what happened here. 
uh, in the end, it didn't cost us any ships. I mean, we lost the battle. It is what it is. Uh, they had to go back to port. They repaired. And then for chuckles, because I was like, well, you know, in straight-up fights where it's not a, like a provision fight, uh, we seem to be absolutely cleaving through these wooden ships, which is what I expected. Again, even though the cotton-clad ram is not the best level of ram, right? It's got a level 1 rams, I think, go up to level 3. And uh, so I, I was a little surprised. But out here off of Hatteras, there was a 7 ironclad gunboat and a 4th rate steamer together in a fleet. Uh, we captured, in this Battle of Chesapeake up here, we captured... Uh, the unions, it, either it was here, we got a casemate ironclad, I think ram, I don't, well, whatever we had, and um, I intended to put it in the, the cottonclad fleet, but it wasn't ready. So, I engaged it with the, the cottonclads, and to my surprise, we just barely beat them. And it became one of these kind of pillow fights where, surprisingly, the ironclad gunboats couldn't do that much damage to our, our wooden cotton-clad rams. Uh, and it just became a readiness duel, and I think we just barely beat them. Uh, but our readiness tanks, so it took a while to, to restock ammo and everything after that. Uh, and when I looked at the, the damage, because I went on the, the Union side as well, saw what we had I was watching the, 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 the battle take place. Basically, the damage that was being given and received by both sides was pretty even. Uh, you know, we just brought a couple more ships in, so that, that might have turned the tide. Uh, I, didn't do the cal I didn't do the calculations for all of these, but so seven ironclad gunboats and a fourth-rate steamer, I'm going to wager, are, are going to be more than the value of those same cottonclads that we use down in the Gulf to sink those high-value fleets, the same cotton clads that we used to go after all those wooden ships. We sunk a few before we got pushed out of that second kind of major engagement up there in um, in the Chesapeake. Uh, so I, I don't think we've lost any. Uh, they might have captured one at this point, but it, it's not been a big deal. The next... Target, uh, we put six cotton clads that were relatively healthy and the casemate ironclad ram that we captured against seven motor schooners and a fourth rate steamer. And they're collectively, I guess, about one and a quarter million. We beat them, and this is the other nice thing about win winning those naval battles, is that we took three of those ships captive. All right, so that's just free real estate once you go ahead and beat them, get them all repaired up and ready to go. Uh, now you can turn them into to whatever you need them for, uh, or sink them if you just don't don't think they're worth it. But I, I probably wouldn't recommend doing that. Uh, we didn't win everything, and you shouldn't expect to win everything. That's that that's asking a bit much. Uh, the next engagement ends up being a loss, but it's it's kind of the provision pillow fight thing again. So we got. 10 cotton clads and the casemate ironclad ram. Uh, basically, the cotton clads were rebuilt. I think three were around 75% health, but everything was pretty healthy. And so my, my fleet wasn't beat, beat too bad. Uh, we took them in the Chesapeake against a fleet, three frigates, some schooners, a fourth rate. However, there were other Union fleets around that joined in. So they ended up sending three or four reinforcing fleets against the one fleet that I initially sent in. So it was 38 of their ships versus 11 of ours, and we lost. I did sink two of theirs before we did. One of our cotton-clad rams got sunk. This is definitely where one of them got captured. Uh, prior to this, their blockade ratio had been 30% of our ports as, as the CSA. After this, though, we took it down to 19%, and I think actually that conflict ended up over here if I remember where their ships ended because they had a whole bunch of fleets that just sat on top of each other after that and they didn't go anywhere for well over a month so I think both sides tanked one another's readiness uh, our fleet got away we rebuilt uh, what was what was left 
And and most of it was left. Seven or eight conclads were... I guess eight were left if we went in with ten and lost one and had one captured. Uh, but we went out on the hunt after that, kind of a little bit wiser. The, the, the takeaway I, I got from that, I sort of think that, you know, maybe this is something I should watch for, is that when you only go seven wide, it might not make sense to bring in many more than seven ships. And I test this later with multiple fleets. You know, having a fleet get reinforced versus having a fleet fight, lose, and then a secondary fleet come in and start a new engagement. And I'll talk about that when I get there. Uh, but there is a difference, uh, to, to my surprise. Uh, but next, the Conclads, they go out and uh, they take on three more frigates, a double endered. Oh, that's right, we went back to Chesapeake. And so we were going after the fleets who beat us before. We went after our our previously captured cotton-clad ram, a pair of fourth-rate uh, steamers, two schooners. We sunk three of them and sent the rest of the fleet running. But then uh, a bunch of their other fleets showed up. I had a secondary fleet come in and reinforce me, but the long and the short of it was uh, we just we ran out of readiness. And so we had one fleet go back to Gosport. The other ended up uh, going back to, I think it was Wilmington. Well, it, it went somewhere. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, so we didn't lose anything. Uh, we did have one of our rams go down to, to, to 40%. Uh, it took about a week for the... I mean, that's the thing is that Conclads, because they're not that complicated to build, even if they get pretty banged up, you can get a lot of them going in a relatively short period of time uh, if they're in harbor. So after about a, a week after that, I put some of the weak cotton-clad rams in harbor to repair, and I took seven healthy ones and the casemate iron-clad ram, and then I brought up a secondary cotton-clad fleet that I started building later. Uh, and I was trying to, to wrestle control of the Chesapeake once once and for all. Because it felt like we were generally winning the battles, but then we lose them at the end because of uh, these kind of provision pillow fights. And so this, this is where I, I, I ran this test. And uh, I sent that initial fleet out and the secondary fleet. You can see where these flags are. And you see it's mostly CSA wins, but... Uh, the fleet that came from over here actually arrived first, and then the fleet that came out of Gosport arrived second. And they engaged the, the Union fleet that was here. The thing is, is that the, the fleet that came up as reinforcements from Gosport, they kind of sat in the background of the fight. It didn't look like they were ever taking any damage. And then there was a kind of pillow fight between the first cottonclad fleet that showed up and whatever was... Whatever was here. Uh, let's see. Did I write it down? Looks like 18 ships, two seam frigates, eight sloops of war, two ship tender gunboat, three fourth rates, two third rates, and a broadside ironclad. Uh, and that was in two fleets that were stacked up, one on top of the other. What I was kind of hoping to do, I was hoping that the fleet from Gosport would get in the fight first and draw one or both of those fleets into Fort Norf Norfolk Garrison's range, but I just missed. Uh, it's something I, w I might try to game a little bit better uh, to see if you can kind of bait the AI into to maybe engaging that fort. Anyways, uh, we lost. Uh, I, I I guess I'm not not really that sure, but I, but I am, I am kind of sure. It ended up being... Uh, a provision pillow fight. And so I'd saved it right before that. And I went back and I loaded in again. And I sent, I forget which fleet in for it. It doesn't matter. But I sent one fleet in first. It, it was a big pillow fight. We lost initially. But then I sent the second fleet in against their two readiness. However many fleets were here that they had terrible readiness. My fleet was fresh. And it came in and it just walloped them. Uh, we were outnumbered. It, it's mostly cotton-clad rams on our side, but they were ready to go, and the other fleets had been engaged, and they just they just weren't. So that that was 
that was pretty good to know. Uh, we didn't... I don't think we disintegrated any of their fleets, and so sure enough, after a while, they came back. I brought up the Texas Maritime Department. I'm not even sure if they're going to be on here anymore. But it took me... Yeah, they're, they're not what they used to be. It took me almost a year to get uh, a seven... Right? The reason why you do seven of a ship, if you want to kind of test out and see how it does, is that the combat width is seven wide in these open naval engagements. On rivers, it's three wide. Uh, but I wanted to just see uh, how the casemate iron rams performed. And so after a long period of waiting, we brought them up here to the, the, the Chesapeake. They took on 22 ships. It's basically uh, a lot of the ships that we had fought earlier. Uh, there were uh, some of the co captured cotton-clad rams they'd taken from us. We were up against them. And those casemate Iron Rams did fantastic. Uh, we captured four ships. We uh, captured a broadside ironclad. And th our casemate Iron Rams took basically no damage, even though they were outnumbered three, three to one. Uh, yet again, what came in, what kind of turned things around after this, was that their readiness was tanked. Our readiness was tanked. And so they sent in a fresh fleet, and it pushed off these ships that had taken basically no damage. And I was like, all right. Uh, but I, I was kind of expecting that at first. So we had the cotton-clad fleet that was still here from the previous engagement. We sent them in. We pushed off the fleet that pushed us off because they tanked their readiness in the fight. I, I think I've brought up the example enough now to kind of show you what I think the takeaway of all of this is. Uh, which is that readiness seems to be a huge, a, a much larger factor in a lot of these naval fights. Uh, folks have noticed that frigates tend to expend their ammunition quite quickly. I'm not disagreeing with that. Uh, I pointed out that a lot of the rims don't have many guns. They don't take all that much ammunition. And yeah, when you're shooting cotton clads, you don't you don't really do all that much damage. Uh, you're not going to do that that much damage to them. So the the, the kind of takeaway is that I, I don't see a huge advantage to having fleets reinforcing other fleets in naval combat. I haven't tested enough to see if it also matters in, in fort combat. My inclination is that it doesn't. Because what seems like it happens is you send a fleet to attack a fort and there's a certain, you know, there's the morale bar at the bottom, there's a certain progress. And if you send in additional ships, I don't see them necessarily shooting the fort. I, I guess the seven wide also applies there. And it seems like if you send in reinforcements to what was a losing initial engagement, then they just lose along with whoever initially engaged. Uh, and on these kind of surface contests, fleet versus fleet, it's the same kind of thing. So if, if you have a losing fight and the uh, initial fleet is seven wide or more, then your reinforcements aren't going to be able to add more to that unless your initial fleet starts losing ships one way or the other disabled or they leave the combat or they're sunk or whatever and then it seems more likely that the reinforcing ships might start having an effect but otherwise it seems like the reinforcing fleets are beholden to whatever the initial fleet does and so if it loses they lose along with it so while it might be tempting you know get in there and help them out the smarter play may be to send in cotton clads Whatever it is, but a, but a good defensive fleet that's wide enough, soak up a lot of damage, take the other side's ammo away. And if you don't beat them straight up, just send a second fleet in that's about as wide, and you should be able to, to push them off in the readiness contest. It, it seems cheesy. I, I, I don't know what else there is to say, but it also seems like if you want to play the more logical, less cheesy way and combine forces against combined forces... 
the game doesn't do a very good job, in my, in my opinion, of, of, of simulating that. So uh, that would be my suggestion. Again, this was by no means the most optimal thing. But my point is, in the end, I believe I built 20 cotton clads. Uh, this is after different testing. This is uh, some of the tests I did for, for blockading. So if you don't see him over here, it's not like, oh, he's just making this up. I think we made 20 cotton clads, and we probably finished with 16 or 17, uh, plus all of the ships we captured, plus all of the ships we sunk. The cotton clads more than paid for themselves, plus the amount of blockade percentage that they helped take down. Uh, I have not, unlike other videos, tried to do like a dollar and cents account. I think the initial engagements in which they got, uh, let's see, what was it, four times their value? Yeah, when they got basically seven times their value, it didn't really matter what they did after that, but they went on to, to fight a number of engagements, uh, put a bunch of dents in, in the Union Navy. And so I think they're a very good asymmetrical response. And to my surprise, not just to wooden ships, uh, again, beating the ironclad gunboats out here, which are not bad at all early on in the game, and then beating fleets up here that had captured conclad rams, frigates, and the, the casemate ironclad, that that was all big uh, for these wooden rams with bales of cotton on them as, as kind of quasi-armor. And so for their cost, I think they're very good. Remember, once you strap torpedoes on there and they get up to level 3, I think their ramming efficiency doubles. And so this thing that's already super efficient gets gets even more efficient. All right, that's going to do it for this video. This is kind of how you fight the blockade in a cost-effective way. And the short answer is conclad fleets uh, one at a time rather than multiple attacks. Don't put them against forts uh, for reasons you can expect, right? Wooden ramming ships are not good at taking down forts. Most wooden ships aren't good at taking down any forts anyways. Uh so don't have them do that, but have them focus primarily on the wooden ships, and they can go against uh, ironclads. Beware, it's probably going to be the provision pillow fight. And now that, if you didn't know how to fight those, now that you know how to fight those, uh, you should be successful in winning those, and that might allow you to capture some of those ironclads for free, which just makes uh, the conclads all that more valuable with steel. All right, folks, the, probably the next, and I think it's going to be the last tutorial on the Navy that I'm going to do is where I talk about perks and the, the perks you assign to, to different specialized fleets. And uh, who knows what's next after that.